Father, I pray this morning that you'll grace us. How do we communicate all of this but by the grace of God? I pray that you will move upon us, Spirit of God, and that you will open our hearts to receive, our spiritual ears to hear, and our spiritual eyes to see things that we've not seen before. I pray that you'll help us to understand what has happened on Friday when Jesus took it all upon himself so that we could be dead to sin and alive to Jesus. Thank you for this morning where hope rise and gives us confidence and that we have life in Christ and that we can live with hope. Do as you seem pleased this morning. Touch, change, touch and change lives and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read you a scripture out of 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, 3 to 9 and then 17 to 21 and one or two others. Have you got that on for us? I'm going to read it from the board in the front of me. Blessed be the God of, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in these last days. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then verse 17 through to 21. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct receiving by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope is in God. Then I want to read to us from uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says this, To them God willed to make known that are the riches, what are the riches of the glory of the, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ. I want to talk to you this morning just quickly a little bit about that we dare to sin and self, that we are alive in Christ, but because of this morning, we live with hope. We live with hope. It was um, last year in August that Edna and myself flew over to Canada uh, because we had the sad news that we've lost a spiritual son to cancer. We, uh, it was a very sad time for us as we flew over and spent time with this beautiful family, uh, a mom and five children, and a whole city that celebrated the life of a very precious man that loved God sincerely and lived life well as a son of God and a disciple. And, um, and we could celebrate his life and with great gratitude and sadness spend time with him. Um, as we were over there, uh, we, we just roamed around and places, had a coffee here and there, and loved going into bookshops. And so we went into a bookshop, and my eye caught a table that promoted books. And this one caught my eye. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, I want you to buy it. I want you to buy it and read it. It will be good for you. It's called The Happiest Man on the Earth. It's 
a book by Eddie Yaku, a, a man that was a, a Jewish, a German Jew that ended up in the concentration camps in Germany. And the atrocities and the suffering and the hardship and the difficult of his entire life and the, the dreams that he dreamed as a young man. He studied to be an engineer. And what happened to him in and through that time and how he came through the other side and uh, eventually got married. He went over to live in Australia where he lived a very positive, successful, happy life. Wrote the book and he launched the book when he was 100 years old. Died last year, the 30th of October, 2021. I read this book and in through all the tears of losing a son and uh, reading the, the sadness of the story, it stirred my heart, realizing that if he could go through this and come out on the other side positive, how much more can we with Jesus? I read something to you in the, in the introduction. It says, the Nazis took everything from Eddie, his family, his friends, and his country, but they could not break his spirit. Overwhelmingly grateful, he made a promise to smile every day in thanks for the pr precious gift of life that was given to him. Eddie calls himself the happiest man on earth. In a remarkable memoir, this born storyteller shares his wisdom and reflects on the amazing life, talking warmly and openly about the power of gratitude, tolerance, and kindness. Life can be beautiful if you make it beautiful. And I want to talk to you this morning about the fact that Jesus made life beautiful for you and me. As you sit here, especially in the day and the time that we live in, that many people live without a sense of hope. People kind of endure. We are uncertain about that which, was in and around, that which is in and around us. But I've come to tell you this morning, because of Sunday morning, there's hope for you and me. Can you imagine that? You know, Christianity is not successful. It's not authenticated because we have a Bible. We don't believe in Jesus because we have a Bible. The sermons that Jesus preached did not authenticate or made Christianity genuine or believable. The miracles that Jesus did did not authenticate Christianity. Because Jesus rose from the dead, it made the Bible authentic, his message authentic, his signs and wonders authentic, and who we are authentic. Did you know that? You see, Jesus and his disciples didn't do Christianity because they read the Bible. We've got the Bible. And people wrote about what Jesus did and what he preached about because he rose from the dead. That's important. Willie said it. We spoke about it this morning. Can you imagine? That's why it's so important. We, we can't have Christianity without Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We can't have it without Friday because if Jesus didn't take our sin, sickness, and diseases upon him, there's no way that you and I could justify ourselves, save ourselves, redeem ourselves, sanctified, justified, got ourselves out of trouble because we were guilty as sin, as they would say. We could not change ourselves and Jesus being willing. You know, it's an amazing thing that we, there's so much to share in and around this time. This is such an important time for us to remember and to reflect so that it's not just a religious holiday. It's not just something religious that we're doing. It's a time that we sit still, think and reflect about what God has done for us. That Jesus, you know, somebody said they killed Jesus. In a way they did. But they never killed Jesus because he said this. He says, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. It was, it was an agreement between Father God and the Son that says, Son, 
it requires a, a sacrifice of blood. It requires a life being laid down. It, it requires a precious holy lamb to take upon himself. And Jesus said, I am willing. So that the Hebrew writer writes to us and says, with the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Because he decided that he was going to yield to what is required by God and lay down his life by himself for you and me so that he could take it up again. So Friday had to happen. Without Friday, we can't be set free. Without Friday, we can't get ourselves, rid ourselves from the, from the feeling and from the experience and from the load of condemnation and self-judgment and unworthiness and, and, and this everything that goes with it, depression, oppression, and, and, and all the other sins that we can ever think in sickness and diseases. If it was not for Jesus that willingly, intentionally, lovingly took upon himself the sin of mankind, we could never be free. We could also not be free if it wasn't for Saturday. Can you imagine that? On Saturday morning, Friday was a disappointment. If you've been with Jesus all along for several years, if you are not, remember, they didn't just listen to the teachings of Jesus himself who proclaimed and declared things about himself as a carpenter's son, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. It was difficult for them that had such an image and a perception of who God is and how holy God was and is to then begin to imagine that this man that they knew lived amongst themselves was one of the brothers was James, that he would now be the savior of the world. How hard was it for them to imagine and Jesus would proclaim things, declare things, and then demonstrate things the way that he reached out to the sick and the, and the hurting and those that are living in guilt and condemnation as he could continue to say things about people who don't deserve it that makes them feel loved accepted forgiven and all of those things all of those things begin to penetrate their hearts and make them think and rethink about who he is and who he was and and what this was all about not not just that they see and experience that but constantly jesus remind them out of the scriptures of the old testament that this thing about his death who he was was declared and proclaimed by prophetic voices before isaiah the psalmists People saying there will come one that will liberate and set you free so you don't have to live in and under the law anymore, but that I will write my laws upon your heart and that you will no longer say to one another, no God, for you will all know God because I'll reveal myself to you. How challenging was this? this these people, as they, as they begin to to form in their own minds pictures about who this king would be, what he would do to overthrow the, the rulers of the day, to, to override what happens to them so that they can have a king and a champion and a warrior that will deal with the Roman Empire of the day, sit on the throne, and they will be the triumphant nation and the glorious kingdom nation. As they begin to, to try and work this out as simple fishermen, as people that sometimes get confused in their own understanding and, and ed education about this Jesus, and all of a sudden Friday came. A whole week of suffering and struggling, waiting for every moment for Jesus to say, rip his shirt over and say, Superman. And nothing happened. And as they behold and watched and saw everything happen, I can just imagine, can you imagine the anxiety, the fear, the uncertainty in their hearts as, as, as their lives, as their souls begin to drain from confidence and faith and, and hope to a place of uncertainty and, and what, what's happening here and what's going to happen to us to Friday when he hung on that cross and there was no life in him. Can you imagine Saturday morning? No leader. The Bible says that all the followers were scattered. Peter denied Jesus at the fire. It was not restored yet. It only happened later. All of them in different directions. No leader. No followers. No message. No movement. Just a grave. It's important that we understand that so that what Louis shared this morning when he shared in the offering, that we understand there was nobody of all the disciples, nobody of everybody that said, 
And you can read that in the Gospels as you read through the Bible and all the Gospels. Nobody said, everybody doubt except me. Not, not, not one of them could write that. A, a few of them tried to, but I was hanging in there. I was str- the Bible says they were scattered, full of doubt and unbelief and uncertain. To be honest, when the message came out that he was alive, most of them doubt, all of them doubt that that could be possible. No leader, no followers, no movement, no message. Nobody wanted to say, hey guys, it's Friday morning, let's get together for a breakfast and let's preach something about faith. Nobody said, I don't know where he is, but he taught us so many great things, we're so excited about it, let's choose a leader amongst us and get this movement going. There was nothing. It was dead. It was going nowhere. There was no voice. There was no excitement. There was no let's do it thing. So that we can say together, by grace, are we saved through faith in what he's done, not because we hold it together. I wonder whether you've ever been in your life as a Christian in a place where everything has been dead, silent, without direction, leading, movement, and conviction. Dead, dead. Because that's why Jesus came to make dead things alive. And then came Saturday. Isn't that amazing? You see, Paul writes about this. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, you need to understand how important the resurrection is. Because without it, we've got nothing. Without it, we're just another religion. Without it, he says, in 1 Corinthians 15, you can go and read it for yourself. Without it, we are still in all our sin. Without it, Christ is dead and our faith is dead. He says, there's no victory in any area and over no demonic force in our lives. You will be controlled, manipulated, held in bondage, and and directed into directions that you don't want because there is no victory over anything. Following Christ is meaningless. Applying Christian truths, principles, and values is of no worth. And ultimately, all religions are equal. We are the only religion that don't mourn the death of our leader but celebrate it. Can you imagine that? Paul is writing about all of this. And then came Sunday. Jesus rose. Everything changed. And that gave us hope. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. In this moment in time, can we just think a little bit about that? Can we just reflect a little bit about what has happened on Saturday for you and me? How Jesus took the very thing that you and I deserve, the punishment for our sins upon himself to remove it from us so that when we say, I can't save myself, I can't change my own life, I can't direct myself, I can't sustain, maintain myself, I need to fully and completely rely upon what Jesus has done for me on the cross. Something We call that repentance. We call that metanoia, changing your mind to think differently, believe differently, and put your confidence and your trust somewhere else rather than yourself. When we see that fully, when we understand that fully in the changing of mind that we will not rely upon ourselves and anything else, it also breaks our heart. Makes us sad because we realize we have trusted, rely upon other things in ourselves. And when we repent, that godly sorrow that brings true repentance changes the way we do life. But at the same time, it brings hope. You know, I looked at what hope means. What constitutes hope? How do you define hope? There are different definitions for hope. It says it's an optimistic, positive state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes. It's a nice definition, isn't it? I was thinking about it. I thought I could should pause here for a moment and ask you the question, how optimistic, positive, and a positive state of mind are you enjoying right now based on an expectation of positive outcomes? I would have loved to hear a roar. Yeah! But we are challenged, are we not? 
if we're honest, we challenge. We challenge with, with where we are. Maybe you are, you are trusting and kind of somewhere believing, but you are full of doubt and unbelief and uncertainty due to all kinds of circumstances and situations around, around you. you. You're not sure about that situation that can be improved concerning life or finances or living conditions or relationships in marriage or friendship or wherever it is. You're not so sure whether you are that optimistic. To be honest, I bump into good Christians that are skeptical, negative, cynical, and full of doubt and unbelief and roast beef. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'm not, I want to I wanna just call to you. I want to call you to remembrance. I want to say to you this morning that if Jesus died and rose, there's hope for you and me. And we need to revisit it. That, that takes discipline. It takes focus. It takes us intentionally, deliberately directing our faith towards not ourselves and what we see, but towards this God that did it. How optimistic, how positive are you today? Uh, it says another place, it says just simply hope means you've got a feeling of trust. You trust. Another little definition says, ultimately hope is to know that you will have a favorable outcome. A favorable outcome. I wonder if I ask you those questions this morning concerning your life and South Africa and the world and what's happening in and around Ukraine and Russia and other parts of the world and people that have struggled and suffered so, so badly in KwaZulu-Natal with the floods and all kinds of other things just happening in our backyard. We don't, we don't even have to go far. We can just look around us and realize there are people struggling and battling and, and we have got the message of hope. The, the question is, the challenge that we face is how much hope do we carry in our hearts? How real and authentic, how alive is it still in our hearts? Are we really convinced or is it just a cliche or religious confession that we make? Because I want to tell you this morning, we sang a nice song, but it's much more than a song. It's much more than a nice word. We, we can have a feeling of trust, a favorable. To be honest, the, the best translation of hope is the biblical one when when. The authors or the writers of the Bible speaks about hope. That translation of the Greek word is not just favorable outcome. It says joyful expectation. Because our hope is not in a man, not in circumstances, not in situations, not in the economies of the world, not in the armies or the govern uh, governments of the world, but because our, our faith is in this God that rose from the dead, this Jesus that rose from the dead, we don't just have trust and a favorable outcome, we've got a joyful expectation. So what constitutes hope? You have to have a word from somebody. You have to have truth. You have to have faith in that word and that truth so that you can trust it. There needs to be integrity, faithfulness, and power to bring it to pass. And Jesus was all of that when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's this God that speaks right through the Bible when, when Israel again and again choose to disobey him, miss the mark, look somewhere else, find something else to, to stimulate or stir them, look at something else to help them, or long for things that, that, that would not be of any benefit to them, but nevertheless turn towards it, that God in His mercy and kindness continue to reach out to them and give them hope. So much so that in Zechariah, when they find themselves as prisoners, God speaks to them in Zechariah 9, He says, return to your stronghold, you prisoners of hope. I declare that I will restore double to you. Isn't that amazing? In, in the worst of circumstance, in the worst of situations, God, because of who he is and because of his heart for his people, who just wants them to acknowledge that they can't save themselves, provide for themselves, direct themselves, that at any given time where they would just think about turning to him, he would show mercy. I'm, I'm getting to something this morning. I'm getting to something this morning. First of all, that this God of us is a God that is willing to be a mediator and a sacrifice on our behalf so that you and I can find freedom, liberty, and forgiveness. 
Secondly, that he's always willing to give his life for our life so that what we don't deserve we can have and what we do deserve he would take away from us called mercy. And not just that, he's prepared to give us hope for the future so that we don't fumble around and live in anxiety and fear so that as we heard in that beautiful spoken word this morning, he's done away with death and the fear of death so that we can live with faith, confidence, and hope this morning. Return to your stronghold. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. God says, even in this situation, if you are in bondage today, if you're stuck somewhere today, if you can't see how tomorrow can work out and that there can be any future for you and you feel imprisoned by your circumstance, your situation, by something or anybody, Jesus says this. He says, return to your, I am your stronghold. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. In Jeremiah, again, when they are slaves and they are living in another country, God sends Jeremiah and he says to them, tell them, tell them to look at me, tell them to come to me, tell them to, to put their confidence and their trust. I said it on Friday morning, I said, remember this, having faith is not sufficient because the Bible says even the devils and the demons believe, they tremble and shake. Trusting God means fully relying, having your confidence and your, uh, and your hope in nothing else but Him, knowing that He alone can do it. And then Jeremiah he says to them, even as you find yourself stuck, he says, come to me because I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says God, to give you a future and hope. Isn't that phenomenal? And then he says in Romans 8, 10, 11, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of my righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to those, to those mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Because Jesus rose, we're alive. We have hope. We have hope for tomorrow. We've got eternal hope, and we are carriers of hope. That's why Paul writes to the Colossians. He says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because Jesus is alive, and we have hope in his person, his word, in his outcome of his life, we have a future. And we are the people that are supposed to speak hope, live hope, look like hope, and be hope. Say to the person next to you, you look like hope. You smell like hope. You know, you know what's an amazing thing? I often used to visit our uncles and aunts. They, they were, some of them were farmers. And, uh, and there's several things that you learn about animals, especially when they teach you to do horse riding. And, uh, and work with animals. Animals smell your fear. Amen? When you look into somebody's eyes, which is this, the windows to the soul, you see when people are despondent, discouraged, negative, or full of hope and faith. Come on. Amen? And I want to say that to you this morning. When, when we preach what we preach, the difference between this and living a defeated life and a true sense of hope is not just whether we've got a mental understanding of it, but whether we make the choice to put our confidence and our faith in God wholeheartedly and trust Him with our lives for our salvation, for our deliverance, for our outcome, or whether we just believe and still make our own plan. And when you have somebody that have come to a place where they realize, I can't anymore, I can't do this, I, I can't make life work, I can't make business work, I can't re make relationship work, I can't make myself work, I can't, and, and bless Jesus. I said it the other day, I want to say it again, I want to say thank God for every person that have counseled me, encouraged me, motivated me, helped me, and stood with me, but you can get saved without a church, a pastor, a doctor, and a psychologist. 
I'm going to use them in the meantime as much as I can. But I need you to understand that we get saved by the glory and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and the spirit of the living God, not by the effort, the counsel, and the motivation, and the prompting, and the pushing, and the pulling of mankind. It's when man comes to a place of conviction, you cannot save yourself. You cannot carry on like this after you've tried every conceivable thing and have gone to every conceivable friend that you've ever had and have to fall in your place's place. And on your face, face, and get saved. Somebody would say it in Afrikaans, this lippet in die klippe and you lack sand. When you're there, when you are there, and you call out to God, so that God, all by himself, in his grace, mercy, and kindness, reaches out, and a supernatural miracle takes place because we transferred our confidence and our hope from anything else towards this mysterious message that a God would be so kind to take sin, sickness, and disease upon himself, forgave us, rose from the dead, and give us his life. It's a mystery. It's a mystery that a man can come off his knees from a state of helplessness and get up and feel delivered and set free from guilt, sin, sickness, and disease because he surrendered his heart. Wow. What does resurrection mean to us today? How do we practice resurrection? What difference does it make to you and me? How do I live this life now? It's a new life. His life becomes our life. You receive from Christ His life. It's eternal life. We receive abundant life. We receive a life that has lost all fear of death. That's why Jesus writes to John. He says, if you are still fearful and full of anxiety, you have not experienced the fullness of the love of God for you and towards you so that it can utterly and completely destroy any feeling of fear of death and anxiety. I see life and this earth and people different because of his life. I remember the day that I got saved and I came out of that room, everything changed for me. The trees look different. The birds look different. Everything looked different. We live different. That's why Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, he says, it's no longer I that live. It's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in him and in him alone. We've got a new identity. No longer am I dependent on what people think of me, say of me. I can't even call myself whatever I want to call myself because I find my identity in the one that now lives in me. I've got a new culture, a new race, a new religion. I've got, an, I've got everything that's new. I think about everything different now. I'm a son and a daughter of God. I'm an heir of God, a co-heir of Christ, a friend of God, a servant of the Most High God. I'm a new creation. I'm an ambassador of Christ. I'm a peculiar person. Not weird, peculiar. I've got a new level of intimacy. No longer do I beg and crawl in and ask God to do things. I know that He lives in me, and because He lives in me, I'm His, and because I'm His, I'm invited to come freely into His presence and worship Him and talk to Him, and I can hear His voice, and you can hear His voice. He speaks to us, tells us about life, even tells you about special deals in the grocery store. He's amazing. Not just do I go into a new level of intimacy with the Holy Spirit living in me. I hear the Father's voice and experience His presence and His power. I've got a brand new level of authority. When things want to manipulate me, intimidate me, whisper in my ear, try to tell me who I am and who I'm not and what can and can't happen, I've got authority in a name that's above every name because I know that name rose and that name is alive and that name gives me an authority so that in the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that this Jesus Christ is Lord and the Savior. And we can't go into this life hopeless and fearful, intimidated and manipulated. We can't just let life happen to us. Jesus says, he says, no, 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 no. He says, you are prison. Even if you feel imprisoned for a moment, whatever it is that you, and he says, turn to me and let me give you hope right now in your situation because I killed that thing. I wiped that thing out. I conquered that thing so that if you just listen to me and hear carefully and obey me and use my name, you're going to get out of this thing to tell a story that you serve a champion king.
I almost said I preach better than what you say, amen, but it's okay. <laughs> are you listening to me? This We are blessed this morning. I, I, I don't know what it is that's talking to you this morning. I don't know what voice, whether it's just you and yourself, you know. I said to my children often, I said, watch out that you don't get into self-conversations, private discussions in your own head. The devil joins you there. Watch out that you don't check too much what's happening on the news, and not that you want to be ignorant, but don't let it so intimidate and manipulate you that you become a hopeless, negative, skeptical, cynical Christian that speaks about hope as a distant thing and can't speak out of a deep conviction in your heart because somehow you think man's going to save us and we're going to change the world when he says, no, it's you and me one at a time that will see how God changed your heart and remove fear and give us hope and confidence. It is one encounter with a living God that will change world leaders, business leaders, people of influence, authority, and wherever they find themselves, one encounter with a living God that can change our circumstances forever when we live with a sense of hope. Just like Naaman's little servant girl took to general and said to him, there's hope for you in God. Even if you can't save yourself, heal yourself. Let my God touch you. I'm preaching the whole Bible this morning. Let me close. Worship team, come up here. We're going to worship Jesus. Listen carefully this morning, church. When we choose, when we humble ourselves, when we come and we're honest, when we, whether we are the Eddie Yakus or just the Louis Elses or the Joe Soaps of the day, whether, you, whether you've gone through some radical situation, whether you find yourself in a radical situation, Whatever it is this morning, there's hope for you and me because Jesus rose from the dead. It's not, it's not just a religious saying. It's not just a charismatic Christian quote. It's the reality that makes us different from everybody and anybody else because Jesus conquered sin, sickness, and death so that when we put our faith and our confidence in him, everything changes. Everything changes. And there's hope for you and me tomorrow, today. Not just is there hope for you and me today. I, I, I went for long walks this weekend and the previous week. I, I said, God, how do I communicate this thing? How do I tell people the glory of a reason? How can man communicate this thing that you've done? And God says, you can't. You have to just tell them what my word says. And then trust me that my spirit will reveal it to humankind. That as they put their confidence and their faith in me, that I will supernaturally deliver them from heaviness and guilt and fear and anxiety and everything that goes with it. So that their confidence and their faith is not in man's preaching and teaching, but in the power of a living God. We're going to worship God this morning a little bit more. Before we do, I want you to close your eyes if you don't mind. This is the mystery of this thing. We're going into holy ground now. We do things like this. We say, Jesus comes to us. And if we didn't get what I just preached, we make it complicated. We get confused because in the light of what I just shared, Jesus comes and he says this. He says, if you, 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 if you, if you believe with your heart that God would be so kind and so gracious because not because you're so lovable but because he is love not because you did it right that's why Romans 5 says he says while you were still sinners while we were still enemies of God scheming our own schemes and working our own works and, and kind of using God on the sideline as an option while, while you had false motives and all that stuff in your heart going on he says Christ died for you when you had no intention to say yes to him, he gave his best and his all unconditionally. And if you, you, you and me, if you would dare to believe that, if you, if you would believe that with your heart and say, Lord, and then he says to you and me, you can't even believe with your own faith. You're going to believe with my faith. I'm going to give you faith to believe. 
It's not how hard you sweat. It's not hard. And, and I praise Jesus, you know, whatever your condition is this morning of deep sorrow or sadness or great joy or whatever it is, is in a sense irrelevant because our faith and our confidence is in, wow, did you do that for me? He said, yes, I did. And if you would believe that, if you choose to believe that with your heart this morning and confess with your mouth that you will not trust in yourself, not trust in other things, not rely upon your ability, your skill, your connections, your resources, but upon Him alone, He says, I'll save you. And I try and work that out and I say, no way. How, how do you do that? He says, that's my super, supernatural part that I do. Where, where you are just surrendering and I come and I take the load of sin and I forgive and I, and I come and live and make my home in you. And something supernatural happens, guilt and condemnation and the weight of of all of that falls off your unworthiness and you become a son and a daughter of the living God and he makes you his own. And people come out of meetings like this and times like this or place in their inner room and say, I don't know what happened. I feel so light. I feel so free. I feel like I'm a new person. I feel I've got hope for tomorrow. And I can't preach on a Sunday like this and not give somebody an opportunity to say, hey, pal, hey, friend, I need, I need that. And I want you just as you sit before we and sing a beautiful song, I, I want to just let you think for a moment. Because Friday came and he took it for you. Saturday came and Surely you feel hopeless and without any faith and confidence. And then Sunday came and he said, but if you put your confidence in me and what I've done, your whole life can change. And there's somebody sitting here this morning and, and God's inviting you to surrender your life, your self-management and maintenance to total surrender to him this morning and give him your life not just your hardship and your difficulty and your pain, give Him your life. And if that's you this morning, right there where you are, I want you just to raise your hand because I would like to agree with you in prayer and let something shift as you just say, that's me, God, that's me, that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of struggling in my own ability. I'm, I don't want to live in this anxiety and this fear. I see your hand, young man. Hold it up there. If that's you, thank you, ma'am. I see your hand. I want to pray with you a sincere prayer this morning for Jesus to, to connect with you, this living Christ, this, this one that paid the full price. If that's you, I want you to put your hand up because God wants to touch your life this morning. Hey, and it doesn't just have to happen here, but I want to give you at least an opportunity for the urgency that somebody feels in their heart this morning. If that's you, put your hand up. Father, I thank you for those hands that are up this morning. Thank you, ma'am. I see your hand. Whew. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. I worship you, Jesus. I magnify your name. I honor you. I celebrate you. I'm deeply grateful and thankful for your kindness. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you've put your hand up this morning after the service, I want you to be so brave to come to the front. Somebody's going to help you, just give you something and help you. Just say a prayer with you. I, I want you to be so bold. Just do it for Jesus this morning. I want us to close in prayer. Won't you stand with me this morning, please? I want you to think about that for a moment. How optimistic, how positive are you about South Africa, about your life, about your relationships, about your marriages, about your business? Maybe you're in 
I know it's Sunday, but to you it feels like Saturday. And I want to say to you, it's okay if right now it feels like Saturday to you. Because I want to tell you, Sunday has come and is here. And I want you just for a moment to allow God to speak hope into your heart where you are this morning. Because it's not dependent on people around you. It's really dependent on the kindness of a good father. And just for a moment, as we're going to worship God this morning, I want you to be real personal with Father. Say, God, here I am. I've got, I've got some Friday in me. I've got some Sunday in me and a whole lot of Saturday in me. Will you please do something for me this morning? Will you, will you speak as the God of hope that lives in me, hope to me, so that I can become a hope for those that I will see this afternoon and Monday and Wednesday and next week, for those that think there is no hope, that I can be a true carrier of hope. Can we do that this morning? Why don't you just lift your hands for a moment and just speak to Father and just tell Him where you're at. And I want to tell you, you are blessed. You have got the King of glory living within you. You've got a hope in you that far transcends and outlives whatever the devil wants to do to you and with you. Let's worship Him. Father, we bless you this morning in Jesus' name.